I have a couple of slides here that you don't have, uh, you don't have note pages for, uh, but we're going to come back to covenant. We're going to come back and review covenant. But I want to introduce just briefly the idea of covenant. Uh, covenants are extremely important in the Bible. It seems that whenever God wanted to uh, let people know uh, what he was committing himself to and what he was expecting of people, uh, he would uh, uh, form a covenant. He would enact a covenant. And so just a brief introduction to covenant right now. Um, we looked at this. Uh, you have this in some notes from when we were looking at uh, uh, earlier on. Uh, you have this in, in the note page I handed out that had three overheads on it. It would be back um, somewhere back there. You can find it. Somewhere back around page 14, 15, look in there, and you'll have this slide at the bottom of that handout page. Um, we noted that uh, creation really uh, gives uh, the mandate, the purpose, as to why God created human beings. He created them like Him and created uh, human beings uh, as His image, uh, those who would stand in His place as his functional representatives on earth for the purpose of ruling. And he says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and so forth. And so mankind was created for the purpose of ruling, a caretaker who governs according to the will of the creator or a subordinate surrogate king responsible only to him, only to God. And that's uh, Eugene Merrill in his uh, Old Testament theology, Everlasting Dominion. And so right at the beginning, we see God's purpose, uh, and God is hereby really committing Himself to a certain course of action. Now, it's kind of risky, you say, because man proved not to be uh, uh, worthy of this and proved not to uh, uh, fulfill it immediately. But nonetheless, God said, this is what is going to happen. And really, the rest of the Bible is working out how God is going to see this ultimately fulfilled, see this come to its uh, complete intended uh, end. And so we will find the, uh, the idea of covenant uh, coming in here. Now, uh, you can use the back of uh, your uh, chart where we did the pattern of primeval history to jot down some notes here. I'm going to go over this material quickly uh, there's one. There's just one slide here that I'm going to expect you to have the notes on. This is just a little bit of uh, background. The word covenant is used more than 250 times in the Old Testament, and 10% of those are in Genesis. It carries the ideas of a treaty. When countries enter into treaties with each other, that's how the word could be used, or a pact, or more commonly today what we'd be familiar with as a contract. So there are some differences, there are many similarities, and there are different kinds of contracts that people enter into. Most of the references uh, to covenant refer to an agreement between God and people, an agreement that is always initiated by God. Now, there are covenants uh, we find mentioned in the Old Testament between human beings. Uh, David and uh, uh, Hiram of Tyre, or Solomon and Hiram of Tyre, entered into a covenant. David and Jonathan entered into a covenant. Uh, and, and you find kings entering into covenants with each other, and these are mentioned in the Old Testament. But the kinds of covenants that God enters into are not those. Those are covenants between equals, and they, uh, they each have certain expectations and certain obligations. God enters into covenants with His people on a couple of other patterns. In the Old Testament, there are... Uh, a couple of kinds of, of covenant. A covenant always involves obligation. It always involves obligation. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a legally binding, if you want to put it in, in, uh, in that way. Uh, when you go to buy a car uh, off the used car lot, all of you will buy cars off the used car lot, right? You don't buy new cars? Yeah, probably, all right. Do you just walk in and say, I think I'll take this car? And the salesman says, fine, go ahead, here are the keys. Pay me sometime if you feel like it. Nope. <laughs> you enter into a contract. Uh, it doesn't work like that. There's obligation involved in certain kinds of transactions. And covenant involves the idea of obligation, the expressed intents of which may be brought to pass in one of two ways, with no conditions or by meeting conditions. 
And so there are two ways that biblical covenants are enacted by God. Some that have no conditions and some that have conditions upon uh, uh, the human participants. Now, in the ancient Near Eastern uh, world, we find this very common. And for more than 2,000 years, we find examples of kings entering into covenants with their people and uh, with each other. And interestingly enough, God uses this custom. Of course, he's the one who's responsible for it anyway because he created the nations and he created people and he created with social capacity. He created them with the, the needs and desires to relate to each other. And so all of this is uh, uh, something of his creation. Uh, and he then is able to use this to illustrate certain things about his relationship with people and his relationship with nations. And so we find in the ancient Near East two kinds of covenants, the royal grant covenant and the suzerain vassal covenant. When we get to the book of Exodus, we will see how that illustrates the second kind. But it's the royal grant covenant that I want to mention in terms of uh, a background for considering God's covenant with Abraham. A royal grant covenant, and uh, just jot these down. This is the only thing I really want you to be responsible for out of these first few slides, was unilateral, unilateral. That means it was one-sided. Bilateral is a two-sided where both parties take upon themselves responsibilities or obligations for the outcome of whatever agreement uh, is involved. But Royal Grant Covenant was unilateral. It was one side. It was unconditional with respect to the recipient of the covenant. And it was the awarding of a boon, that's an old word, uh, just a a lavish uh, gift, a lavish uh, uh, benefit or a blessing by a superior to an inferior. So when we're talking about the biblical covenants, it will be God who decides that He is going to, without any condition, uh, without any obligation, He is going to extend to a human being or human beings a lavish blessing, uh, just a lavish benefit. And it's based solely on the benefactor's goodwill. Now, where we find these, and it even fits in the biblical record as well, it will often be in response to some loyalty or some act of uh, devotion shown by the inferior, by the subordinate, but it is not dependent upon that. Once this agreement, once this commitment on the part of the superior, on the part of the the one in charge, and when we think of the biblical covenants, that means God, once he decides that he is going to extend to the recipient this lavish benefit or blessing, it is himself and only himself that is dependent or is is, uh, uh, critical to the fulfilling of this. And we do find these kinds of covenants in the ancient, uh, ancient Near Eastern world. Now, we're going to find that uh, the covenant that God enters into with Israel, the nation, will be of a different character. They will have all kinds of conditions. But initially, when uh, God is entering into this agreement with Abraham, He is saying, I am going to do this for you, and it only depends upon me. This is going to happen. Now, Abraham was still called to obedience. Abraham still had to do certain things. But ultimately, it was God who was taking upon himself the outcome of his intended result. So with that little background of the royal covenant, we want to look at the Abrahamic covenant, which really is an example of the royal grant covenant of the ancient Near East uh, utilized by God to make an agreement with Abraham that has far, far far-reaching effects. And now we're on our notes on page 31, and you have some blanks that you can fill in here. And you already know the first six points. Uh, God promised to Abraham what? We've learned this in conjunction with our walkthrough. Three things. Land, seed, blessing. Because there is a whole system of theology that says, well, what that really means now is heaven. Huh? Yeah, well, we'll come back to that. So land, seed, what's seed? It's the biblical word for descendants, all right? And blessing, we'll talk about that. 
So um, God's promises were first of all, oops, what do we got here? God promised Abraham land. Genesis chapter 12 is the key passage, not for the covenant. The covenant is actually struck in Genesis chapter 15. But Genesis chapter 12 is the background. Genesis chapter 12 gives to us God's intent. It lays out for us uh, what, uh, what God is intending to do with Abraham. And then he actually uh, uh, enacts and uh, seals the covenant uh, as a covenant in chapter 15. But we see here three promises to Abraham. It says to, uh, uh, Lord said to Abram, get out of your country. What was his country? Okay, Ur, way down here in Mesopotamia. From your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you shall be a blessing. So he tells him to go to a land. And we know that's the land of Canaan. And he says, um, um, I will make you a great nation. Now, that involves people, the need for people. And he will later on specify and specifically state, uh, you know, I will multiply your seed. And that would be necessary for there to be a nation. And then he says, blessing. I will make you a great nation. That's a people promise, a descendant promise. And I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing, or you might translate that, be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we'll come back to that because uh, that uh, has some pretty important uh, ramifications. So we see here clearly in the uh, these three verses in uh, Genesis uh, 12, the promise of land, seed or descendants, and blessing. Now, these promises were made, what? How do we say it? Literally, eternally, unconditionally. Literally. I want you to take a look at Genesis chapter 13, if you have your Bibles. Genesis chapter 13. Abraham has uh, finally left. He's come down into the land of Canaan. He's stuck in Haran for a while. And when his father dies, uh, and Abraham was probably in delay of obedience here, and a, which is a form of disobedience. And when he comes down into Egypt finally, and then he, he goes back, and once he's back, and once he and Lot have separated, and what were the three things God told Abraham to do? Leave your country and your father's house and your relatives. Well, Lot's his nephew. Lot's still tracking around with him. And once those three things happen, then God begins to show Abraham specifically uh, about uh, the land. And so verse 14 of uh, Genesis 13, And the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, interesting that he mentions that, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and to your descendants forever. Uh, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also should be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. And we are going to see uh, that this is uh, developed and mentioned several more times. It's going to be mentioned with respect to the people that live in the land and the boundaries of the land. So God starts to become very, very specific with Abraham. To this point, Abraham really didn't have uh, the boundaries of the land. He really didn't have specific information. But God is beginning to give it to him. So it's literal, it's real land. And that's important as we get uh, uh, further on in the Bible. Genesis and the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis is like the foundation of a of a skyscraper. It's like the foundation of a tall, tall building. Now, if any of you have ever observed construction sites where they're building a tall building, they will start digging a hole. And when you were younger, you saw this. You might have thought to yourself uh, or asked your parents, I thought they were going to be a building. Why are they digging a hole? Well, because foundations are extremely important. 
And the larger the building, the taller the building, the more complex the building, the more important is the laying of the foundation. And so tall buildings have deep, deep holes dug to build their foundations because if that foundation is not constructed properly and if it's not sufficient, once the building gets to a certain height, it's just going to fall over. Well, Genesis 12, 1 to 3, and the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis is the foundation of the rest of the Word of God. And so you need to understand the foundation. So when you get to the penthouse, when you get to Revelation, you know where it was built and what it was built on. And these six points will give you a summary of the foundation elements or piers as it is or pillars of the... uh, of the whole Bible. It's an eternal promise. Notice what he says in verse 15. For all the land which you see I will give to you and to your descendants for ever. Okay, that's a long, long time. It's an eternal promise. And it's unconditional. He says, Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. All right? So very clear, unmistakable. It could be that that uh, new creation has a relationship to this. It could be a reformation, a recreation. If he burns it off with fire, refashions it, similar to the first creation account where he fashions the material into the inhabitable earth, that could be how it, it, it would be literally eternally and forever. And I think that's a distinct possibility. But also realize that words like all and forever with a limited vocabulary that Hebrews had uh, is filled in by context. So, for instance, eternal, as long as there is anyone or any of your seed around, I mean, you know, clear to the end, it's still, you know, to the future from us. So if God chooses, you know, to make a breaking point at the new heavens and the new earth, but I don't see a problem with there being a continuity between the new heavens and the new earth and the present one, just as our bodies. When we die, our bodies are going to do what? Decay and just, I mean, completely dissolve. But what's God say he's going to do? He's going to resurrect those bodies. Now, are those bodies going to be the same as the old bodies? No. But there's going to be, there's some continuity with it because he says the dead will rise in Christ. And so it could be the same with the new heavens and the new earth. Though the earth would be destroyed, yet it would be out of that that he would refashion the new heaven and new earth wherein righteousness dwells. And so like we, will have an eternal body and that body will be brand new. It will still have some kind of continuity with our present physical bodies. Could be that. Yeah. Good question. And a question that everybody asks at one point or the other. <laughs> okay. Um, So, literal, eternal, unconditional, I will give it to you. Now, what we find here is that the the whole program of God is to bless. I will bless the earth. I will bless the earth. Now, we come back to covenant. I'll I'll go in a little more to to what blessing is and and how to understand this, and uh, we'll summarize all the covenants. But at this point, um, I think we need to think of blessing in terms of what was God's original intention for mankind. To go, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, and to have dominion over it. And so blessing has to somehow fit in with that original mandate that God gave. And what he's saying is, is that through you, I will bring about the fulfillment of my original intention. I will give you this great benefit and enable you to carry out this great benefit. And so Abraham then becomes the key to God's program of blessing that has not just uh, implications for Abraham or for the nation of Israel, but for, what does it say here in the text? All the families of the earth. So this has tremendous ramifications But it's a phased work. And so we first of all see an individual, one man being set apart. Abraham is to leave what? His country, his kindred or his relatives, and his father's house. That's uh, what God tells him to do. Now you could say, well, isn't that a condition for the covenant? 
Well, it was a prerequisite for God entering into covenant with Abraham to be sure. If Abraham had said, I'm not leaving, not going. And maybe somebody else did that God called, but Abraham wasn't the first. So there was a prerequisite with regard to Abraham responding, and Abraham was responsive to God, and Abraham did become loyal to, to, loyal to God. And as I mentioned before, the grant covenants would often be given out of uh, uh, in appreciation of loyalty. And so you could say that Abraham did have something to do with his entering into covenant with God. But once God makes the covenant, Abraham does not have anything to do with its ultimate fulfillment. So Abraham is to leave country, kindred, father's house, and it's only after he does that that God enters into covenant with Abraham. So you could conceive of it as a precondition, but there are no conditions after the covenant. There are no conditions of the covenant to its fulfillment that Abraham will be responsible for. And that's what's important to keep in mind with regard to it being an unconditional covenant. So it's first of all the individual phase. And then he says, uh, I will make of you a great nation. And that's the first thing he says. There will be one nation, and this will be set apart. Uh, From this set apart man, there will be one nation that God will use in a particular way, and that will be the nation of Israel. Now, what do you have to have to have a nation? People, all right? That's one thing. You need two other things. Some place for them to live, all right? So people are always associated in some locale uh, for them to be a nation, all right? Now, does that alone make a nation? What else do you need? A ruler? Like a king? A wife? A wife? <laughs> To have a nation? <laughs> okay. Well, you have to have people. What's that? Okay, a form of government. When did the United States become a nation? Mr. Glock just told us last week, or this week. Huh? <laughs> 1776? All right, that sounds good. What happened then? Uh, did the Declaration of Independence make him a nation? That was that was a necessary preclusion because what was that? That was a, a declaration that the 13 colonies were going to sever themselves from the rule of England. Okay, once they defeated the Redcoats, were they a nation? What were they? They were still 13 separate colonies. What made them a nation? The Constitution. It's when they all signed the Constitution and they bound themselves together as these United States. At that point, they became a nation. Even though there were people in a common territory that had uh, you know, much in common with regard to a lot of things, yet it was that Constitution that, that, that formally bound them together. That gave them the ways they would function and so forth. So you need a common people. You need a common land, and you need a constitution, a something that binds them together, a form of government. Now, uh, the most rudimentary kind of a, of a nation would be where you've got a, a king or a warlord, and he says, I'm the law, and you obey me, and this is how we function. And there are nations like that, okay? Those are the less stable kind of nations because they're always getting beat up by another king or warlord or overlord or whatever. But... But these are the the common elements. And so we should anticipate that this is what is going to happen as the Bible unfolds. And indeed, that's what we find. From one man who is old and his wife is old and they have no children and she's unable to conceive and have children, God creates a nation. Starts with the birth of whom? Isaac. Okay, Ishmael, not Ishmael, but Isaac. And then the, from Isaac, you've got Jacob. And then Jacob, you've got 12 sons and one daughter. Okay, and then they go down to Egypt and they become a mighty people. Are they a nation? When do they become a nation? They become a nation at Mount Sinai. 
because that serves as their constitution. That serves as that which binds them together as a functional people who are a nation then among the nations. And we will talk about that when we get to Exodus. So there will be a national phase to this. And ultimately, there's a universal phase, blessing. Um, All nations blessed in one man through one nation. That's the whole intent and scope of the Abrahamic covenant. So total enrichment or the realization of the creation mandate. You can write that underneath there. I'm adding new things as I go along. So you've got three phases. One man set apart. One man. Abraham, leave. Go to, your, go to this country. Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. And that son has become a numerous people. In fact, it's going to become many nations. But out of that one specific nation I'm going to use to ultimately bring my intended uh, purpose to fulfillment in all the earth. And so um, these are the, the promises. This is the subs- these are the substance of the promises uh, to Abraham. All right? So you got those six points, land, seed, blessing, literal, eternal, unconditional. We've kind of been driving those home as, we, as we've been working on the walkthrough for the last week or so. So, you know, those become then the foundation elements for the rest of the Bible. Uh, that's the passage that we've been looking at. Now, let's... Uh, continue on and see how far we can, uh, we can get. So, Abraham has been given this challenge, this, uh, this tremendous potential... He obviously responds to that. I think he's hindered by his father. He's not able to just break loose. So his father, in fact, Genesis 11 says his father, Terah, took them and moved to Haran. And it was after Terah died that then Abraham goes into the land of Canaan. So God had to wait for Abraham to get in place. And there were some negative ramifications to that. But nonetheless, Abraham does respond to God. And we see God then uh, going ahead with uh, his intentions with Abraham. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that in chapter 11, when Sarah mentions his plan, that God says, oh, I think it's chapter 12. Chapter 12 really is a flashback statement. And if you read uh, Acts chapter 7 in Stephen's speech, he makes it clear that God called Abraham while he was in Ur. And it, it, that isn't inconsistent. And, and actually, the Hebrew tense of the verb there in Genesis 12, 1 could, could very well maybe better be translated now. God had said to Abram. And, and so you do have some of that overlap and summary. Genesis uh, 11 has kind of taken it all the way through to end the genealogy family thing. And then chapter 12 is sort of, a, okay, now here's how this all came about. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, the Abrahamic covenant. Um, And here we move to Genesis chapter 15. We have Abraham coming into the land in chapter 12. We have him leaving uh, uh, to go to Egypt in in chapter 12 because of a famine. He gets into trouble down there. We have Abraham coming back in chapter 13, and he and Lot uh, separate, and that's when God specifies uh, some more detail about the promise. Chapter 14, we have him... uh, uh, acting in a very extraordinary way of going off after some kings who have taken uh, Lot and uh, the people of uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. We find him uh, encountering this uh, Melchizedek, uh, priest of the Most High God, in chapter 14. And it's in chapter 15, then, that God actually formally enters into covenant with Abraham. Um, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. Notice his name is still Abram and we'll comment on that in a moment, in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And uh, we see that the condition of Abraham's heart was one of fear. Uh, Why would he be fearful? Any ideas? Huh? Huh? Yeah, it's the Lord. It says, don't be afraid, Abraham. 
Don't be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield, your exceeding great reward. So Abraham is fearful. God is calming his fears. What would Abraham have to fear? I mean, he's just, he's just gone off and with his 318 you know, servants, retainees, and they've gone against four or five kings of the uh, Middle East and routed them, and phew, he's, in, you know, he's invincible. You know, Braveheart. What, what have I got to fear? Victor? Okay, all right. Yeah, we read through here the, the you know, inheritance thing. Abraham says, Lord, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, the heir of my house, Eliezer of Damascus? I mean, the whole thing with, uh, with family, land, property, inheritance, extremely important. And so here he is. He's left uh, security. He's left uh, inheritance. He's come to a land where he has no inheritance. And uh, even what he has, he has no son. So, you know, is his whole life going to be wasted? I mean, how long has he been living on this promise? How old is he? I mean, he's getting toward the end. God, how long does it take for you to work? You ever feel like that? Sure we do. And so, you know, he's got some concerns. We see the state of Abraham's mind in verses 2 and 3, and that's the whole issue. What do you give me? What indication? I go childless. The heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Uh, custom, the oldest uh, son of his, of his oldest servant or some servant would become his heir. Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So that's the state of mind. He's in confusion over what God is uh, uh, doing, how he is going to fulfill it. Further development of God's promises then given in 4 and 5. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look down toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to them, So shall your descendants be. Now, Abraham couldn't see the number of stars that we can with our telescopes and so forth. But in a dark, 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 dark night, uh, with no pollution in the atmosphere, you can see a lot of stars. And in fact, if you've ever tried to, you ever tried to count the stars? Yeah, how far did you get? Ten. <laughs> okay. No matter how far you get, you always say, "Oh, did I count that one?" Ooh, I got to start over again. I mean, it's just yeah. So basically, I mean, it's it's a figure of speech. It's a hyperbole. It's an exaggerate. But but he's saying, you know. Don't worry about one child. I'm going to give you, the, you know, descendants as the stars. He's later going to compare it to the sand and the seashore, the dust on the earth. And so um, we see the further development of the promise with regard to children. And then in verse 6, we have a sort of a summary statement. Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Again, I take this as sort of a summary flashback statement. Stephen says, by faith, Abraham left Ur. I think Abraham was already a believer. Abraham had already been justified in Ur. And again, this could be another flashback. Now, by faith, Abraham had believed in the Lord, and he had counted it unto him as righteousness. So Abraham's relationship with God was one of faith, and now he's being called to live that out. You know, like uh, later on, uh, the just shall live by his faith. The justified one who has been declared righteous and is eternally secure before God shall walk day to day by that same faith, by that same trust. And so Abraham is calling, being called here to, to live by his faith. Now in chapter 15, uh, verses 7 to 21, we see God's covenant in Abraham's future. Uh, God addresses Abraham's uncertainty in uh, chapter uh, 15, verses 7 to 11. And first of all, in verse 7, he reminds Abraham of his purpose. He reminds Abraham of his purpose. He said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. So that's his purpose, uh, to give you the land. That's why I brought you here. So don't be 
frightened. Don't be concerned. Don't be agitated. Verse 8, Abraham asked God for assurance of his promise. He said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So Abraham is looking for some kind of confirmation. And the confirmation that God is going to give to him is the striking of a covenant, the entering into uh, a formal covenant arrangement with Abraham with a duly recognized uh, a means of signing the covenant. And we're going to have to pick that up on Friday because our class period is over. Uh, but we see here that, that God is just uh, leading Abraham into uh, a clear understanding of, of what he is going, uh, going to do.